O God, help us to listen to your word with understanding, to receive it with faith, and to obey it with courage. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. The title of this message is, The Master Becomes the Slave. As we look around the world today, would you agree that some power-thirsty people have a lust to dominate others in a kind of master-slave relationship? We may think of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ukrainians are fighting for freedom from dominance by its neighbor. So there's a master-slave relationship. The central story of the Old Testament is the problem of slavery and liberation from slavery. The great Passover event that we heard, uh, that we hear about in Exodus chapter 12, which we didn't hear tonight, but it's in Exodus chapter 12, The Passover meal commemorates this moment of liberation. The Israelites had been enslaved for 400 years, and slavery and oppression still exist around the world today, don't they? In a great act of liberation, God brings the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt to freedom breaking their chains, overcoming the master-slave dynamic is the essential work of the God of Israel. He frees the people. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets said to the people of Israel, who had established themselves as a nation, how can you treat foreigners as you were once treated? Don't you remember how you were treated as slaves in Egypt? Do not treat people that way. There should be a whole new way of organizing your life. And then fast forward to the New Testament. There appears on the scene around the year 30 AD, Jesus of Nazareth, who speaks of the kingdom of of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. And that means God's way of ordering things. What characterizes this kingdom proclaimed by Jesus? Well, we hear much about it in Matthew's gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7, which begins with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We often call it the Beatitudes. And Jesus' sermon tells us that God's kingdom is not about hungering and thirsting for domination, rather hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Not clawing after the highest position, but rather embracing meekness and mercy and compassion. Not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone takes your coat, give them your cloak as well. Love not just your neighbors and friends, but Jesus says, love your enemies. At the heart of the gospel is an overturning of all the forms of the master-slave dynamic. Look who Jesus ate and drank with. Sinners, tax collectors, the sick and the poor. Over and over again, Jesus overturns this master-slave problem. He turns the world's views upside down. In John's Gospel, during supper in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus gets up from the table and does something so out of the ordinary that we are still talking about it some 2,000 years later. 
He takes off his outer garment and ties a towel around himself precisely in the manner of a slave. And he proceeds to do a task that was so lowly that only the lowest of the slaves was expected to do it. He begins to wash their feet. Perhaps because we do it as a liturgical expression, we miss how unnerving this act was for his disciples. But we hear it expressed by Peter. Peter protests. He says, no, no, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Can you imagine going to a banquet and sitting at the table, and then you see the host get up and proceed to go around and shine everyone's shoes? I think we'd feel kind of embarrassed about that, wouldn't we? And that is something of what the disciples were feeling. And remembering in those days, 2,000 years ago, in a desert region, people wore sandals. And they walked everywhere they went, and so their feet got dirty. And it was a custom of that time for when you entered somebody's house that the lowest of the slaves would come and wash your feet. It was a custom. We wear shoes and socks, and we drive around in cars, so translating it to, to today, it would be kind of like showing up at somebody's house in your, car, in your dusty car and getting out, and the first thing your host does is come and clean your car for you. It's a similar kind of thing. But here, 2,000 years ago, is this exchange between Jesus and Peter. And Peter says, no, Lord, you cannot wash my feet. And Jesus replies, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Jesus is saying, do you want to be a participant in this new way of being? This is life in the kingdom of God. This is a watermark in Jesus' ministry that overturns the master-slave dynamic. The master becomes a slave. Jesus said, If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And now we see what the kingdom of Jesus looks like. We have moved from Passover to the washing of feet, and now we turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, to read how Paul recalls what Jesus did on this night, the institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus took bread, broke it, and said, This is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This is the climax of Jesus' ministry. He is with his intimate friends, the 12 disciples, and he is expressing what he is all about summing up the fullness of the kingdom of God. If we are stuck in a master-slave mentality, what are we interested in? Well, we're interested in getting to the top and staying there. What does Jesus do now as he sums up his life and ministry what they are all about. Jesus now gives himself away. This is my body. This is my blood. Jesus does not grab for position or power or authority. Rather, he lets them go. It is into these dynamics that we are invited to enter tonight. With the washing of the feet, the master becomes a slave. Jesus gives away his life, his body, and his blood. 
And we are invited to enter into the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, and give our lives to him and to one another and to our neighbors. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this very humbling and shocking story of how Jesus once bowed before his disciples as we bow before you now. We thank you for all you do for us. Wash us, and we shall be whiter than snow. Help us to wash one another. Help us to pass on the blessing that you give. May we be humble enough to admit that without you, we can do nothing. We come to you tonight and receive your body and blood given for us. Nourished by our communion with you, may we be loving enough to go and help someone else in their time of need. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.